This is Dr. Kevin of Associates of South Texas. I'm going to show you a small people cataract surgery and eye stent implantation on the same patient. This is a patient with a moderately dense cataract uh, who had coexisting mild glaucoma that we were going to implant an eye stent in at the end of the cataract case. You can see the pupil does not dilate more than four millimeters and we make our usual side port incision 2.8 millimeter clear cornea incision temporally. We then inject phenylephrine into the anterior chamber using a 27 gauge cannula to see if we can achieve some pupillary medriasis not obtained with the topical medications. After the phenylephrine has been in the anterior chamber for approximately 10 seconds, we inject in a dispersive viscoelastic. You can see that we've got approximately another 1 to 2 millimeters of pupillary dilation. We proceed by performing a capsulorexis, approximately 5 to 6 millimeters, and you can see that we go underneath the iris edge with the capsulotomy in a controlled fashion to get a capsulorexis that is larger than the iris diameter. We then proceed with hydrodissection using BSS on a 27 gauge needle and we make sure that we can rotate the nucleus in the capsular bag. It is important to make sure the cataract is free as this will make nuclear disassembly easier in the latter part of the case. We try to break the nucleus into pieces with a pre-chopper, but the cataract is too dense to adequately get purchased with the Akahoshi pre-chopper. And at this point, uh, we switch to a different nuclear disassembly method. We're going to use divide and conquer, and then we will use the Akahoshi pre-chopper as a nucleus cracker by turning it over to the blunt side of the paddles. As you can see we work within the central part of the nucleus staying within the boundaries of the pupillary margin and we've created a trough and now we're going to proceed to carve out a cross-shaped uh, opening in the nucleus. This is done in the method of uh, Dr. Gimbel and Shepard. We're going to proceed to do a divide and conquer technique, but instead of cracking the nucleus with our second instrument, I find in these small pupil cases you get a better separation of the nuclear pieces uh, using a nucleus uh, splitter or a nucleus uh, pre-chopper uh, turned with blunt sides down. So we refill the capsular bag with a dispersive viscoelastic, in this case it is Endicote, and we're going to use our nucleus pre-chopper blunt side down to divide the nucleus into four pieces. We can spin this in the capsular bag with the pre-chopper and we've broken it into hemi-nucleuses and we're going to break it into quadrants now. We then switch to our fake emulsification handpiece on high vacuum settings to remove the nuclear quadrants. The first quadrant is easily removed inside the anterior chamber at iris plane with care taken to perform the emulsification within the pupillary opening. The second nuclear fragment is removed and it is still somewhat attached to the uh, third and four pieces but this is easily removed in a tilt and tumble or phaco flip type method. Again we try to stay within the pupillary margin as this decreases the likelihood of iris tissue damage by the phaco emulsification and this is the deepest part of the anterior chamber that makes corneal edema 
less likely in day one post-operative cases. The rest of the nucleus is easily maneuvered through the pupillary opening to be removed at iris plane in the anterior chamber. And the nucleus is removed in a efficient and safe manner inside the pupillary opening. At this time, with the nucleus completely disassembled, we will change to irrigation aspiration and remove the remaining cortical material. This is always more difficult in cases of small pupil as visualization is difficult of the peripheral cortex in some instances. Cortical material is removed again from peripheral to centrally using an automated irrigation aspiration technique. The circumferential removal of the cortical material is done in a standard method. A nuclear chip was removed with the irrigation aspiration handpiece and now the subincisional cortex will be removed using this same technique. It is somewhat difficult to remove the subincisional cortex. It is important not to struggle in this area but to use a cannula with balanced salt solution to power wash the central remnants of the cortex off the posterior capsule and these can be removed after the intraocular lens implant is placed in the capsular bag. We're going to inject a cohesive viscoelastic now to completely fill the capsular bag in the anterior chamber and then we will implant our normal three-piece LI61AO lens. The implantation of the LI61AO lens is done in a two-step procedure. The first step injecting the leading haptic and the optic and the second push of the plunger will place the trailing haptic inside the capsular bag. We will use the intraocular lens at the end of the case to perform a barrier between the cortical material and the posterior capsule to remain to remove the remnants of the cortical material that is subincisional. At this point, we will place a dispersive viscoelastic on the clear cornea and we will move the microscope to a more horizontal position. We will get the patient to turn their head away from the microscope and then also direct their eyes away from the operating microscope to give a better view of the nasal angle with the direct gonioscope. You will see that we place the direct gonioscope on the cornea. This gives us a good view of the nasal drainage angle and you will see this in just a second when the patient looks nasally and we place the direct KP gonioscope lens. We can see blood in the canal of Schlem. This is the target for our eye stent implantation. We will then place the eye stent directly through the trabecular meshwork into the canal of Schlem. You'll see blood refluxing out of the eye stent and this will be evident in just a few seconds. We'll see the blood freely refluxing into the anterior chamber above the iris. You can see this nasally. At this point we will remove the remaining viscoelastic and cortical material in the anterior chamber. Also some of the excess hemoglobin or blood that is in the nasal angle. It is important 
to hydrate the wounds and raise the intraocular pressure to stop bleeding from the eye stent through the canal of Schlem, as this will decrease the chances of a small hyphema day one postoperatively. As you can see, the chamber is well formed and the cornea incisions are secure. We placed intracameral vancomycin in the anterior chamber and will rehydrate the temporal wounds to raise the intraocular pressure into the low 20s. Thank you for your attention. This is Dr. Kavanaugh of I Associates of South Texas.